the Great Societal Reset. In this COVID environment, are women finally going back home? Let's cue the rooster and get this show started. my commentary we're talking about the Great Reset. How nearly a million women quit their jobs this September. Can you believe it? Could this be a trend to the back to home movement? More than 806,000 women dropped out of labor force in September alone, according to a new CNBC report. I'll read your report and then I will give you my two cents worth about it. And the article states, and I quote, as the economy slowly tries to recover during the coronavirus pandemic, new data shows that women are still being disproportionately impacted by today's crisis. It goes on to say between August and September, nearly 1.1 million workers aged 20 and over dropped completely out of the labor force, meaning they are no longer looking for work or no longer at work. Of those workers, 865,000 of them were women a number that is four times higher than the 260,000 that were men who also left the workforce. This according to the National Work Law Center analysis. That figure includes 324,000 Latinas, 58,000 black women. For comparison, 216,000 men left the job market in the same time period. Now, let me pause right here a minute and point out that they jumped right over white women to compare minority women with white men in this report. Now, continue on to the report. This is the devastating impact of the ongoing breakdown of our nation's caregiving infrastructure in the face of COVID-19. Emily Martin, who is the Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at NWLC, tells CNBC News uh, Make It program, as families across the country struggle to figure out how to keep their jobs while also making sure their children are cared for, safe, and learning every day. <clears throat> it's women who are being pushed out of work, she says. While all women are undoubtedly feeling the brunt of today's pandemic, Martin adds that black women and Latinas are still seeing the highest rates of unemployment, demonstrating the ways uh, COVID-19 is deepening already sharp inequities in our economy, she says. She goes on to say, black women and Latinas both saw double digit unemployment rates in September at 11.1% and 11% respectively, according to the NWLC data. That's compared to white men, she goes on to say again, having an unemployment rate at 6.5% and white women have an unemployment rate of 6.9%. Notice they finally mentioned the rate for white women here, which is much lower than her minority sisters, but they still compare them to white men first, which is no comparison. Why don't you just compare them to like Bangladesh, Bangladeshi men back, you know, it's crazy. So back to the article. Now Shirley Sandberg, you know her, Facebook's chief operating officer and Lean In founder, uh, agrees that the ongoing caregiver crisis in America has a lot to do with high numbers of women who are leaving the workforce. They're just leaving, not going back. In fact, in Lean In and McKinsey and Company's annual Women in the Workplace report, released earlier this week, researchers found that for the first time in six years that the report has been released, women are leaving the workforce at higher rates than men. So today, according to uh, McKinsey and Company and Lean In, mothers are three times as likely as fathers to be responsible for a majority of housework and child care. Go figure. Now, during COVID-19, twice as likely as fathers to worry that their work performance is being judged negatively because of their caregiving responsibilities during the pandemic. <clears throat> now, as a result, many working mothers are feeling burnt out by the overwhelming demands of both home and work 
<laughs> Sandberg explains to CNBC program, Make It, that even before the pandemic, mothers were already working a double shift, meaning that many working moms would finish the work day and then come home to do more housework and childcare. Now with coronavirus, she goes on to say, what you have is a double, double shift, she says. You know, mothers are spending, she says, 20 or more hours a week on housework and childcare during coronavirus than fathers. Now this report supposed that there's a father in each home, which it is not. We're going on to say 20 more hours a week is half of a full-time job. In addition to the caregiving crisis impacting women in the marketplace, data from the NWLC also shows that industries experiencing most job losses today are industries in which women are overrepresented in. Last month, for example, the economy lost a net of 182,000 state and local government jobs. Well, there is no gender breakdown of these losses. Data from NWLC shows that 60% of state and local government workers are women. Those services are critical services that help support women and their families. Martin goes on to say uh, to NBC that uh, program in July, in regards to teachers, public health workers, and caseworker roles that all fall under state and local government jobs. So one important policy response now, she says, is to make sure that those public sector workers can continue to stay in their job and provide the services that allow all of us to be healthy, that allow kids to go to school, and that allow parents to have the support they need to be able to go to work. End of article, end of quotes, end of bullshit. Now, to my commentary. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, women exceeded men in the workforce and non-farm payroll jobs. They just ate up on men and passed us. When this pandemic hit, it was more damaging to sarcastic women all over the world. Worse than that Thanos snapping his fingers in the Avenger Infinity War movie. Before that, you would have seen braggadocious women all around uttering lines like, I don't need no man. And some of these women were dating and the other ones were married. They seem to actually thrive off of the hatred of men. And you don't have to be a feminist to do that, brother. So little was anyone shocked when society took a Thanos snap, reset, and a lot of women either lost their jobs or quit to go back home. Now, men who have been either abused, neglected, marginalized, divorced, or imprisoned did not shed a tear for these women. The reason that women lost so many jobs was because they dominated so many disposable jobs in a bad season of disposability. Just listen to a list of some of the jobs that women dominated over men. And you'll see why men lost less than women for the first recession of the last five recessions. Women dominated leisure and hospi hospitality, which includes hotels, restaurants, and tourism. All three. Many of those jobs are overwhelmingly women because people are not comfortable having men around them if we are going to be honest with ourselves. You know, if you're going to lie, you say something else. Now, in healthcare services, women dominate the industry over men by a whopping 84% because people simply prefer women around them than men at their bedsides. In the education and education industry sector, women overwhelmingly smash men's numbers of workers by 70%. But the last two nails in a coffin of this women's recession and returning home is that they really don't have a fallback plan. Did not plan on one. Everything was always gonna be great, right? Now, since men have been undermined and marginalized since the 1970s, they certainly can't fall back to them for support. Can't do it. Since state governments have been ridiculously uh, slow with unemployment payments, women can't fall back on that. And lastly, because a Democratic and Republican Congress couldn't agree to a new round of stimulus if their grandmother depended on it to eat, women can't fall back on that either. So this leaves a lot of wives and girlfriends and single girls eating a lot of crow and trying to give respect to the men who they live with that they threatened to leave just last year. I'll walk out on you, she said. These women are finding out the hard way that home is where the heart is and where they should have invested their time, monies, and, in, and just energies a long time ago. The biggest difference between men and women in society today is men are expected to put back more of what they earn into the home. And women are expected to put back more of what they earn into the economy through shopping, pampering of themselves, whatever it is they want to do. So I guess those things are gone for a while. 
Maybe we can get Iron Man to stab his fingers and make everything right again. For Eminem, this is Charles Rivers. We'll be back in just a moment. And don't take any kind of leisure job, because they're on the way out. We'll be back in just a minute. It's five o'clock on a planet somewhere, and we're about to get our drink on. Welcome to the man's bartender. What's up, what's up, what's up, guys? That's right, welcome to the man's bartender. And this week we're doing spiked mango lemonade coolers. That's spiked mango lemonade coolers. Now what we need for that, we're gonna have uh, two cups of water, and to that I've already added two tablespoons of sugar. So on the bottom of that is two tablespoons of sugar. So we're making real lemonade like you would at your uh, grandma's house, granny's house. Your grandfather spiked that behind your grandma's back. So we need that. We need some ice in the bottom of the mixer to start with. Take that, put ice at the bottom. Almost near halfway. We don't need much. Unlike the government, we have to know when to stop, right? So remember, two cups of water and two tablespoons of sugar. That's the sweetener. Now, in the bottom with that ice, we're going to go ahead and put the water. All right, we're getting busy now. Now, to that, we're going to mix about four ounces of uh, the lemon juice. Just like we make a real lemonade. You need some real lemon juice. This ain't that concentrate stuff from uh, dry powder. It's real. Okay, to that we want to put eight ounces. Okay, eight ounces of that vodka. So if you're not toasty yet, you will be. Count with me. One. Carry the one with that make. One more. One more. One more. One more again. What you got? There we go. All right. Now what we need to done past tense is we're gonna go ahead and make sure that lid's on there. Sometimes when you shake these shakers up, uh, you may get where it will freeze. You can see it's already cold now. You see that? It's already cold. But when you do that ice back and forth, that friction. It's gonna really start to freeze to it. Sometimes you can't get the cap off, but at least we're gonna get the top off. Okay, here we go. And putting it. Just a short time. Just enough to get that sugar going and uh, to get that lemon infused into that liquor. All right, so here we go. Now, move that out of the way. Go ahead and put those up there. So you got it for your friend and yourself. But if your friend's not around, hey, guess what? You get your drink on for two people. That's one. And pour it evenly. And since this is my birthday, July. Oh, it's past tense? No matter. Spiked mango lemonade cool. Cheers to you guys. Wow, that's good. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Mmm, spiked mango lemonade cooler. Spiked mango lemonade cooler. I'm just gonna drink a little bit and I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Spiked mango lemonade cooler. Spiked mango. I hope to see you back next time on The Man's Bartender. Join me each week, and we're gonna be making some great drinks, some crazy drinks, and stuff that you prepare for your friends at a party where it looks like you've been a bartender. Thank you for watching in a minute.
And now we bring you Killer Wives, Episode 3, Sunday School Teacher. These are the actual case facts of Marilyn K. Plants, who solicited a murder for hire against her own husband. Isn't trust a bitch? As Mrs. Plants prepares her Sunday school lesson, the fire department is assisting the police in closing in on her husband's killers. Today, in a man's kitchen, we're cooking honey glazed shrimp and garlic and fresh ginger. You don't want to miss it. Stick with us. Hey guys. Welcome back to this week's The Man's Kitchen. This week we're doing honey glazed shrimp. That's good, honey glazed shrimp. If you never had that before, you can have it today. Now what we're gonna do is get the shrimp. You can get it from the grocery store on that side. This has already been deshelled and the veins have been removed off the back. So we're gonna add to that, we wanna use some soy sauce. And I always prefer the uh, Kikoman soy sauce. It's about one fourth cup only, okay? One fourth cup. So just a regular size cup, you're just going to use one fourth of that cup. We want to uh, use some honey. And that honey, we're going to use roughly about uh, anywhere a third of a cup. So a third of a cup of that honey. So we're going to use uh, one fourth cup of soy sauce and one third cup of the honey. And when you're using honey, use something like uh, this olive oil. We're going to be cooking with extra virgin olive oil. Not the regular uh, oil that you would do with uh, vegetable oil because that it kind of flames or gets smoky at high temperatures. And so the extra virgin olive oil works better when you're doing shrimp and the taste doesn't transfer to the food like uh, the corn oil does. But what you want to do is you want to take a little bit of olive oil or whatever oil you got, put that at the bottom of the cup. Because when you put that honey in there, it's not going to loosen that cup unless it has that oil in the back of it and it just slides right out. Okay, so we're going to glaze that. Now, we don't want to add any salt to this recipe because uh, there's enough salt in that soy sauce. Soy sauce is a big name for salt. You don't need any more salt. So to that, we are going to use pepper, okay? To garnish when we're finished, we're going to have some uh, green onions. I've already chopped up here. But to that recipe, we're going to use some fresh ginger. Not that junk that you can get this dry in a can, but I always prefer fresh ginger. You can see I've already sliced the corn off there. 
and they have those little nodules like roots. So you want to chop it up. Uh, make sure to remove the outside surface because that's really not edible. It'll pass right through you. But the rest of it is great when you put it in like Chinese type food. And to that, to season also, so now we're going to use about two teaspoons of chopping a fresh uh, uh, ginger. And to that we're going to add about one teaspoon or two cloves of about the uh, garlic. So it's a garlic to ginger ratio. Alright, so what happens is that ingredients I just gave you is a marinade. Once you marinate some things together, you got the cucumber and soy sauce, you got your honey, your pepper, you got your garlic, you got your ginger. Those things will be chopped up and they'll be added to a, a marinade. Now, I've marinated overnight about a pound of shrimp, just like that shrimp that I showed you today. You see that? That's before you put the marinade on. Let me get the marinade here. So that is what it looks like after you see you've marinated. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and cook that now. We'll put that uh, oven on about medium heat. Shrimp doesn't take any more about a minute and a half per side or less to cook. So you don't want to try to cook like you're cooking a steak or you're cooking a piece of pork. Because what's going to happen is it's going to be, uh, you're going to make that shrimp chewing gum. Shrimp is supposed to be soft. All right. And if you guys seen the last segment, you've seen that I made that uh, lemonade, right? Here it is. Enjoy. If you didn't get that recipe how to make spiked lemonade, that is vodka in there. Go back and look at that part of the video. Now, so like I told you before, while waiting on that pan to warm up, for the ginger. When you have a piece of ginger like that, just cut off a nodule. So I'm cut off a corner there. And it's not hard. So you cut off a corner there, and you can go ahead and take that outer surface off. It's not tough. It doesn't matter if you did it, do it this way, like I'm doing it. Or you can put it on a chopping board, just cut straight down. It's a good way to kill time, isn't it? Okay, so I went around that ginger completely. Okay, you got the outer husk out of the way. What we can do now is one time we'll just cut it in half. Ginger smells good if you never had real ginger instead of just a powdered ginger in your food. So we cut that in half, we we'll cut them in half again. And then what we want to do is take a knife that has a, a round surface at the bottom. We're just going to rock back and forth to chop that ginger up. So it doesn't matter where you start. Take two of the slices at a time. You can just start slicing. It requires really no technique. Just slice it, slice it thin, because you're going to be eating that in that food. Same thing with the other side. And the only reason I'm using gloves, you don't need gloves, is that I'm going to about to take that shrimp out of that marinade. And instead of getting that marinade all over me, while I'm trying to fry it, I just do it that way. So anyway, you're going to do the same fashion for the garlic when it's time. The same fashion for the garlic. But once you get that where you want it, we move that out of the way. You get them all in line, you want to do this. Okay? Just start like a rocking flash. It takes no professional uh, training in advance or something like that. Just find a knife that is around the surface on the bottom and start rocking. Faster, you, the better you get, the faster you get, right? Just go back and forth, back and forth. You want to get it to where it's minced enough where you can eat it. Okay? This garlic is going to be cooked in the food. If you have an allergy or your uh, stomach can't take garlic, find it out in advance. But that's what we're looking for, right there. That's what we're looking for. Okay? Okay, like I said, the same goes for 
the garlic. Let's see if it's pretty warm when we need it. It's almost ready. Turn it just a little bit higher. Now when you're doing the garlic, since it has an outside husk on it, garlic always has an outside husk. That's a skin to protect it. Take it at the top, and you can peel that husk back. You don't want to eat that at all. At both poles, the north and south pole of that garlic, and this is just one clove of garlic. It's not the whole garlic. Until you get every piece of that off. Okay, you see how easy it comes off, just like the skin of any kind of peanut. It comes right off. Same way with that. Move the garlic to the side. Go ahead and cut that in half. Half and two again. One to the side, just like the uh, ginger, just like that. And not to confuse you guys, that's one third cup of honey, one fourth cup of uh, soy sauce, two teaspoons of fresh garlic, uh, minced like you see me missing it right now, and one teaspoon of uh, fresh ginger. So if I didn't make that clear before, I'm making it clear now. Same with rock and fashion, rock and fashion. Back and forth, back and forth. We're not shipping on it, we're not doing it, we're just cutting small pieces that you can eat. Some people don't like raw garlic or raw ginger, but when you cook it, it brings out the sweetness of the garlic. It can taste a whole lot different. Okay, so that's what you're gonna do. Now, all, what we're gonna add that to is we have some rice. So some rice has already been boiled and fluffed up, and that's the rice right there. So that's gonna go on a plate just before the shrimp. I don't think you need another class on how to cook rice, right? All right, so that oil is hot. And what we're gonna do is gonna take that out of there, turn it down a little bit. You don't want to overdo shrimp. It's gonna cook pretty quick, pretty, pretty quick. Let me get a spatula. Isn't this something when you look for something that's in the other direction? Okay, so I got a spatula. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and test the pan with these two that I showed you guys a minute ago. See that oil? You don't need hot oil, so we turn that down some more. We're not trying to cook pork. So Jack can take that right now and take those right out of that marinade. And you see how that pops right there? So be very careful. So we're gonna do it to live on it. And let that calm down. As soon as that calms down, we can add some more. All right, that's about it. Never be afraid of cooking. There we go. So we always cook here things that happen in real life. Television is one thing, but then it's real life. Okay, you can see I turn that down so low, you can't even hear it anymore, right? The one thing about shrimp, you don't want to cook it forever, because it does not take long to cook. All right, that's the last one I got out of there, and look how much of that marinade is left. We, we really don't need that. So we're gonna turn that back up almost to medium to get her going. I can go ahead and take these gloves off now, I don't need those anymore. Don't need that clear either. Get rid of that. Look at look at the mess. Man, that's a real cooking show right there. Tell me you get that on TV. I don't think so. Alright, so we turn it a little bit more. You want to constantly wash it. Notice how I over choked it in this pan? Because I want to give it a nice time to cook, but not too fast. And definitely not too slow. So we're going to leave it a couple minutes on that one side since we turn it down so long. Then we're going to bring it up the other side the same amount of time. 
when uh, years ago when I worked at the uh, restaurant, you have uh, one of the managers in charge. She was telling me I was standing over the plate uh, washing cook, and she said, uh, "Don't need to feed the washers. Do it. Cook. Go do something else." So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get ready for something else. Cheers to you. So what we're gonna do right now is gonna put a little bit of rice on that plate to get ready. Like I said, we'll not take long at all. Now you can tell when the shrimp is done because it's a nice pink color. Nice pink hue that you said it has to. Alright, so put some of that rice on the plate. Get to the side there for a minute. Go ahead and flip this shrimp. Flip over shrimp. It lets you know if it's pink, then that's done. So we got some that are pink and some are not. And some, the ones that are, I'm gonna move those to the outside. I'm gonna move them off of the heat, not as fast. The ones that are not, we move those more to the inside. Now, if you prefer your shrimp more chewy, let it go a little bit longer. Do you wanna chew a uh, whole bubble gum? Don't let your shrimp go that long. Now, this is a glass top of it. What you call a glass top range. So the heat is always weird when it comes to doing something like uh, the shrimp. If it was on a normal fire, it'd been already finished by now. But if you can see it, the shrimp is turning pink, right? It started off with like an off gray color, but now it's turning pink. Now we can go ahead and add the pepper. We can pepper the season. Remember, you don't need salt because there's an awful lot of uh, salt in soy sauce. So we don't need any more of that. Okay, so like I said for this glass top range, it's taking me a little bit longer than it would you on a rather stove top. So I'll make sure that's done. But remember, it's not steak. So I'm just moving around just a little bit. Just about done. That's a good thing about shrimp. It's like the fastest cooking food there is on the planet. Oh yeah, they look good. That looks good. Okay, and they're done. That's all I want to do. Go ahead and put that rice in the middle. Presentation is everything. If you ever worked at a restaurant, you go ahead and move that from the fire. Turn that off. And we'll go ahead and take some of that shrimp right on top of that. Then that seasoning from the marinade is already in there. So you really don't need anything. Okay? Now if you wanted to, we could have saved some of that marinade before you added the shrimp in there and we could have used that again when we started cooking. Right. So give it a taste. Better than Chinese food. Give a little to the house. You guys enjoy. Great having the butcher. Did you hear the taste this? Let alone smell it. Oh, gosh. See you at the bottom. Enjoy it. Try it at home. Stop going to McDonald's. Eat some real food. Love you. Honey garlic shrimp. Or rice. See you soon. Charles again, just want to take a moment out to talk to you guys. If you want to support m and we'd love to have your support. There's a season for gifts. So if you want to get a nice jacket, a hat, or a mug with a new logo from the Early Morning Show, the links are in the top of the description on our page and at the bottom of this video. Take a look at some of the things that we have, and we'll be back in just a moment. Get our famous red hooded sweatshirt, our black cap, our red logoed mug, our t-shirt, 
our long sleeve shirts. And finally, canvas bags and so much more. Head to the store right now. This week on the Men's Medical Moment, we're talking about athlete's foot. How you got it and how to get rid of it. Stick with us. Welcome to the Men's Medical Moment, where each week we give you advice on how to improve your health or prevent disease. Note that if you experience any of the symptoms we state here, to go to your doctor for medical advice and attention. The information we present today is on athlete's foot. Ooh, foot odor, right? An athlete's foot might sound like something mild, but it's contagious, and that is not mild. This information comes to us courtesy of the Mayo Clinic. Now, athlete's foot is a fungal infection that usually begins between the toes. It commonly occurs in people whose feet have become very sweaty or confined within tight-fitting shoes. How many of us have tennis shoes and that sort of thing? So hence the occurrence with more athletes, right? Exercisers or just heavy workers in life in general. Here are just some of the si uh, signs and symptoms of athlete's foot. <clears throat> athlete's foot usually causes a scaly red rash around your toes or on the bottom of your foot. The rash typically begins in between the toes. Itching is often worse right after you take your shoes off and socks. Sometimes athlete's foot feature blisters or ulcers. The moccasin variety of athlete's foot causes chronic dryness and scaling on the soles of your feet. Uh, now, that extends up to the side of the foot. It can be mistaken as eczema or dry skin. The infection can affect one or both feet and can spread to your hand, especially if you scratch or pick it. So you want to keep away from those affected parts with your nails. Now, uh, when should you see a doctor? If you have a rash on your feet that doesn't improve within two weeks of the beginning of self-treatment, with an uh, over-the-counter antifungal product or medication. You should see your doctor. If you have diabetes, see your doctor. If you suspect you have athlete's foot, especially if you notice any signs of possible secondary uh, bacterial infections such as excessive redness, swelling, drainage, or fever while this, while this occurrence is going on, right? So, uh, now that you know the symptoms of athlete's foot, you might want to know what are its causes. Athlete's foot is caused by the same type of fungus that causes ringworm and jock itch, damp socks and shoes, and warm humid conditions favor this organism. So that's how it grows. Athlete's foot is contagious and can be spread by contact with an infected person or from contacted uh, con contaminated surfaces from that person, such as towels, floors, and shoes. So who is at risk for this infection? You are at risk for athlete's foot if you are a man, frequently wear damp socks or tight-fitting shoes, share mats, rugs, bed linens, clothes, or shoes with someone who has, been, who has a fungal infection. If you walk barefoot in public areas where the infection can be spread, such as locker rooms, saunas, swimming pools, communal baths, and showers. Now, what are some of the complications with this particular infection? Your athlete's foot infection can spread to other parts of your body, including your hand. People who scratch or pick at infected parts of their feet may develop a similar infection in one of their hands. Your nails. So the fungal associated with athlete's foot can also infect your toenails. So sometimes you see those disgusting toenails. A location that uh, tends to be more resistant to treatment. Now, your groin. So jock itch is often caused by the same fungus that results in athlete's foot. It's common for the infection to spread from the feet to the groin as the fungus can travel on your hands or on a towel. And finally, here are just a few prevention tips uh, that you need to know. So you want to keep your foot dry, especially your toes. Go barefoot uh, to let your feet air out as much as possible when you first get home. Uh, dry both between your toes after a bath or shower. Change your socks regularly. If your feet get very sweaty, change your socks twice a day. Wear light, wear ventilated shoes, and you might want to avoid shoes made of synthetic materials such as vinyl or rubber. You want to alternate pairs of shoes, so don't uh, wear the same pair every day so that you uh, give your shoes time to air out after each use. You want to protect uh, your feet in public places. Wear waterproof sandals or shoes around public pools, showers and locker rooms. Now, to treat your feet, use powder preferably antifungal on your uh, feet daily. Don't share shoes with people who have athlete's foot. 
Sharing risks spreads a fungal infection. Now, in closing, we share this uh, with you from Healthline. And they say that hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide can effectively kill the fungus on the surface level of the foot, as well as any surface uh, bacteria that could cause an infection. They say to pour uh, hydrogen peroxide directly onto the affected area. Note that it may stink and it should bubble, especially if you have open wounds. Now, peroxide can help eliminate the growth of this infection. This is Charles Rivers for the Men's Medical Moment, saying stay healthy and we'd love to see you tomorrow. Have a great morning.